Welcome everyone to the latest of our virtual events at the American Writers Museum. We're going to give everybody a minute or two to get into the room, so to say, as we uh, I'll let people into the webinar and cover a few short housekeeping things before we begin tonight. As you're watching this conversation, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So you'll see an icon that says Q&A, click that, type in your question. Uh, we'll be monitoring that for questions that we will address later in the program. And we may contact you live via the chat to ask a question yourself if you would like. My name is Gary Cranston. I'm the president here at the American Writers Museum. Um, if you like the kinds of online programs you're seeing from us, you can become a member and get advanced notice of special programs and offers, including book clubs, literary trivia, special behind the scenes, virtual tours, and lots of other good things to keep you busy during this very weird time. Our YouTube channel has videos posted of programs from the past three years. You can check that as well for news and updates. It also includes our recent live benefit broadcast, Onward 2020, which gives you more details about our education programs and how you can support the American Writers Museum. Our book selling partner, both when we're here and live in the museum and here online, is Seminary Co-op Bookstore. And you can order online from them or from our bookshop.org page as well. We're grateful to all of you for being here and for valuing the past, present, and future of American writing. Our guest tonight is a respected authority on energy, world politics. Did I say tonight? I meant today. <laughs> Our guest today is a respected authority on energy, world politics, and economics, as well as a friend of the museum, Daniel Yerga. He's the Pulitzer Prize winning author of The Prize, The Epic Quest for Oil, Money, and Power, as well as numerous other books on energy and international relations. He is vice president of IHS Market, one of the leading information and research firms in the world, a member of the board of the Council on Foreign Relations, a senior trustee of the Brookings Institution, and has served on the Secretary of Energy Advisory Board under the last four presidential administrations. His latest book is The New Map, Energy, Climate, and the Clash of Nations. So welcome, Dan Jurgen. Dan, nice to have Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Carrie. I'm really glad to be on this uh, broadcast at the American Writers Museum. I wish I was there in person. I have to say that the American Writers Museum is a great institution and a great contribution to our national life. And really congratulations to you and uh, all of your colleagues and supporters who have made, who've really filled what was a big void uh, in our national life. And so I'm glad to be part of it today. Thank you. Well, thank you. And, and, and we're, we're, Thrilled that you're supporting. We're thrilled that we got to have you here today, if, at least virtually, for, for a talk about your new book. Um, but before we get into the details of your first book, you know, I wanted to talk to you about, um, you know, your work as a writer. Uh, you know, I really enjoyed the new book. I can now say I am extremely more knowledgeable about the global energy market and how it intersects with issues of climate change and the function of technology. Um, all of those things, but the content of the book is really, well, the content of the book is really amazing. Um, you, you really aren't someone who was an expert who became a writer about your field of expertise. You're really a writer who became an expert, if, if yeah. I've, well, I think what I've seen. That's right. I mean, I mean, ever since I was a child, I was writing. My father had been a reporter at the Chicago Tribune, so I was raised on stories about stories. And, you know, I just started doing it. And so whether I was in grade school, in high school, in college, I was always starting publications and always writing. And uh, just kind of part of my identity that I just assumed I would do that. And what happened really is that my kind of intellectual interests in energy, geopolitics, the clash of nations, all that came together with my writing. Uh, you know, when I was a postgraduate at Harvard, I had two years, nobody was supervising me. So I got to do what I'd done because I'd done my PhD in another subject and I just became obsessed with it. But at the same time, you know, for me, it's writing, narrative, telling stories, engaging people is very much part of what I like to do. And, you know, one of the things I love, you know, I write and then I really love to sort of edit and polish the work and the words and you know, get the transitions just to work right. So I care a lot about the writing and it's, you know, it's something that it's just been part of my identity since pretty much as far back as I can remember. Well, it, it, it reminds me of that notion of um, David McCullough was here when we were opening the museum. And, and, you know, I think someone even said to him, you know, or referred, may have referred to him as a historian and, and he doesn't like to be called a historian. He likes to be called a writer. 
um, because writing is what he does. He his subject is that. But I think you know you're you're someone who is very illustrative of the fact that writing gives you authority. Um, if you're an author, you have authority. You you take control of the narrative. You tell the story. You shape it. So it, it's really power. That's why we exist is really to inspire people on that notion. Yeah, it is interesting because the difference between obviously between fiction and nonfiction. I mean, it's you know nonfiction. You have to stay located in whatever kind of facts that you're using. But I think that even writing is a history. And part of this book is history. Part of the book is the present. And part of the book is about the future. But um, for me, uh, even I, I actually think history is an imaginative act. I mean, when I'm writing, it's kind of like a movie. I see it, and oh, I'm sort of writing what I what I'm seeing as near as I, as near as I can tell as to what I'm doing. So yeah. you know, so you know, I. There's a very clever transition, which I'm very proud of, from the introduction uh, to the first sentence of the of the first chapter. And so we, it says we have to go where our story begins. And then I say, if you want to, then it goes to, if you want to get to the beginning of the shale revolution, you got to get on Highway E35 going out of Dallas. And <laughs> very visual images of what you see is, as you do that. So it's to convey the, the vividness and at the same time, make your argument and your analysis kind of to integrate them. Yeah, and and I, you really do spend a, a, a lot of time shaping these different stories together and interweaving them. You know, you've got a lot of characters and you really do take real people and make characters of them. And so can you tell me a little bit about how you, as you're doing your research and you're working on this, how you're also looking at those stories and how they fit together? Well, I'm, I'm always, well, first of all, I'm always very interested in stories. I mean, when I was younger, kind of, my wife would tell me when we'd be with people, I would interview them. It was just something, you know, I'm really interested in people's stories, how they got from here to there, what was planned, what was accidents of life, the contingencies that got mm -hmm. you there. And so I've always been interested in the stories. So I'm always listening and I'm looking for the voices. And then I guess thinking, you know, I sort of think, who are the emblematic characters? Who carries the story in some fashion, uh, some important thing? And so, for instance, for the story of the Tesla and, it's, and the rise of the electric car, it's not Elon Musk, but it's a fellow named J.B. Straubel, who's a technical director, who's the one who first tried to convince uh, Elon Musk to do an electric airplane. He said, I'm not interested, but I might be interested in an electric car and, you know, look at the impact of that. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm also, you know, stories are about surprises and contingencies, you know, something happens. The shale revolution, which is so important to the U.S. economy, what's called fracking, we heard some of it, you know, in the, in the debates. Yeah. Uh, it might not have happened if some guy hadn't gone to a baseball game and met somebody else who told him about this other technology. And well, there's one last try, let's try this other technology. So I love those sort of almost uh, real life cliffhangers. Yeah. And the book is full of them, which I found so enjoyable for someone who knew literally nothing about this topic um, to get so enthralled in it. And it was those stories, you know, you, and you talk about cliffhangers, you know, there's the, the gentleman whose name I don't remember who, you know, put all of his money and all of his hard work into setting up a distribution center to receive liquid natural gas in Louisiana. And yeah, right. was, was then finding out that the U.S. was not going to be importing and had to suddenly change everything he was doing. You know, yeah. great story. Yeah, a fellow named, that's right, Sharif Suki. I mean, uh, uh, an amazing story. He's, he's invested billions of dollars and then finds out it's all wrong. It's not gonna work. The US <laughs> is awash in national gas and can you turn it around? And, you know, this is, he's not a big company. He's a guy. <laughs> yeah. Yet, you know, it makes it happen. Um, a little bit, if you don't mind, about the um, about this process a little bit more too for you, which I I, I read about you, and I just want to explore a little more is this notion of how you write, which uh, is very much like Maya Angelou, and I don't know if you know that. Um, but can you talk a little bit about your your physical process of writing you know, and well, like this? Um, people, think, people think it's funny these days to know that I write longhand, uh, but. Um, you know, we are influenced by our parents. My mother was an artist. And when I was a child, I would watch her sketching and she'd build up a sketch. And I feel that when I'm writing, what I'm doing is I'm building up a sketch of uh, 
you know, it, it almost looks like a sketch on a page and I put this piece there and that piece there and start to connect them and get the, and trying to get the flow. And the reason I do longhand is because, you know, if we're sitting at a computer, we're like this. And if, you know, if you're longhand, you can stretch out on a couch and be a bit more in a dreamlike state. And I, you know, I once remember reading that Dickens would describe as sort of in a half dreamlike state writing out, not Dickens, but he did write longhand clearly, and mm -hmm. he didn't have a computer, even a word processor, or a typewriter. And I just find that process is very helpful for creating that sort of integrated flow of, uh, you know, of stories and so forth. So I do that. Then the physical, well, first, of course, the first thing you do is you, you jump in, you swim into it. I mean, I did not map out the new map. What I did is I, you know, take one part, get into it, and let the material kind of lead me to where I'm going. Where is the story going? So I'm following the story too. What's the outcome? And then I get, get, get there and, you know, I've forgotten everything over there. I'm not thinking about there. I'm just focused on that. Shape that in the way I described. Then the physical process, then I have to admit my handwriting is getting worse. So <laughs> I have to, you know, then I have to pretty quickly put it into the, you know, into computer, start typing, shaping it that way. And then of course, what you have with the, you know, computers, you have that flexibility to move things around. Is this in the right place? You know, where does the verb belong in the sentence and all those kind of questions. Uh, and, you know, you know, what I learned from my, my 10th grade writing teacher is transitions, you know, how do you move from one point to another? So kind of can, can do that. So I build it up. And then at some point I said, you know, I, you start off saying, well, you know, I'm not sitting down to write a book. I'm not sitting down to write a chapter. I'm just writing some paragraphs. But at some point you look and say, you know, this is beginning to look like a chapter. You know, I think I'm getting there. And, you know, you build it up. Uh, then the other thing somebody once said to me, an editor, you know, you need to know everything, but your readers don't. <laughs> you have to, you, know, then you have to get it, you have to get it down. So the prize, you know, the book you mentioned, you know, it was like 900 pages. The quest was 700 pages. This is, if you don't include Roman numerals, it's 491 pages for age and you don't have to, you know, so the process of cutting. Then the other thing I do, which is a little odd maybe, is I read it aloud to myself yeah. and does that flow. And when you do that, you know, because you're so involved and in, invested in the words that if you don't do that, something that slow, you don't see things. And so, and that sort of gives you more of that flow that you want. So that for me is kind of uh, the process. Um, there's always what the psychologists call approach avoidance. You know, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm not somebody who writes, you know, four hours a day every day. I mean, I, because I do other things and it's, you know, so big blocks of time, but, you know, just to say, okay, I think I'm here now. I think I can do this and just start sketching and see where it goes. So that for me is the process. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. And like I said, uh, both your notion of writing longhand and, and that kind of lying back or lying down or, I don't know if you knew that it's here in the museum, you know, we talked about Maya Angelou's process at one point and she, she wrote longhand on yellow legal pads in a hotel room normally, um, lying down. Who, who did? Um, Maya Angelou. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That was her process. We, she had a typewriter and, and she had other machines, but that was how she started all drafts was in that yeah. same process. Well, it's just, you know, you're just connected in a different way. Uh, you're just connected in a different way, I think. And, uh, and as you say, you're more in that, I'm sure for her, it was the same thing, more in that sort of, not dreamlike, but sort of semi-dreamlike state. Yeah. And um, now, you and I talked about this briefly, but I, I'm, I'm kind of curious on, you, you've got a book that is, you've talked about how you shaped it and how you kind of worked through the process of it. But... You know, you, as you mentioned, it's 492 pages. The number of those pages are footnotes. Um, and yeah, so actually the real book is shorter than 491 yeah. pages. I want to make that clear. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, um, so there's a lot of research that goes into a book like this and, and just a huge amount of work. But this book is also incredibly timely. You're, you're literally talking about COVID. Um, can you talk a little bit about how long you were working on this book and how long you went 
until it went to the printer? Sure. So I, I think I worked on it about four years, um, you know, piece by piece. And pretty much by last winter, it was pretty much shaped where it was going. I still hadn't done the, you know, the two most difficult things I find, which is to write the conclusion and the introduction, which is what you want the reader to take away and why you wrote the book. And I always feel that the introduction really needs to be a roadmap telling, you know, where this book is going to go. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, um, we, um, in our company, we put on this conference with 6,000 people every year. Uh, it was going to be 85 countries in Houston, second week of March. And I think, you know, when COVID first appeared, we now know more about what was going on behind the scenes. But I think people tended to think about it as if you remember the SARS epidemic in, in China uh, at the beginning of this century. But you look at SARS, 8,000 people became sick and less than 800 passed away. And I think that was a mindset, oh, this is like that. But we were going to do this conference and some doctors said, if you do that, people are going to get really sick. You're going to have 6,000 people in a hotel. So the beginning of March, we canceled it, you know, like a week and a half in advance. And people were shocked that we did it because it was not, you know, it was not till the middle of March that we began to understand. And that also said to me, look, at this book is going to be different, you know, and since I wasn't traveling, you know, I could just sort of full time focus on this. Uh, so, uh, so between March and July, I really looked at every part of the book about, like, let's say ride hailing Uber, you would have said one thing about it in February of 2020, another thing now, because it just how it affected everything. And then determined that obviously I was going to write a new chapter because it was not only about the virus, but it was to, to the energy world. I mean, you, we had what I call in the new map, an economic dark age. Now I'd call it an economic twilight zone. Uh, still a very serious, threatening economic situation on top of the health situation. Uh, but you had this collapse in oil prices and suddenly Russia and Saudi Arabia declaring an oil war against each other. And uh, these very dramatic events in which the United States had become the world's number one oil producer. And Donald Trump had said, I hate OPEC. But then he realized that he had this big domestic industry with about, which had before COVID 12 and a half pe million people might collapse. You had something called negative prices. People producing oil were paying people to take their oil away because there was so much oil in storage. And so, uh, and so you had this very dramatic series of events uh, you know, great geopolitical, geopolitical drama between the U.S., China, uh, between U.S., Russia, and, uh, and Saudi Arabia. And then uh, I was able to continue to sort of pursue it. And so finally in mid-July, you know, you get sort of, they said you one pass, they call it, like your galleys. I was now on the third pass. And they said, <laughs> if you keep doing that, you're not going to have an index. So I thought, well, Book like this needs an index. So it was about that point in mid-July that they finally, that famous phrase, you don't finish a book, your publisher takes it away. They, Penguin, took it away. And they were quite right. And within two months, amazingly, uh, the book was published. So I was, you know, so I think if anybody reads it, they'll feel this book caught the curve. It's about, this book is about where we are now, not where we were several months ago. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing that you, a writer's process, you know, the, the idea that, they took it from you in July and that it's out already and yeah. that people are reading it is, is really just- Penguin, Penguin was great. They were very, you know, I, they were a little bit exasperated with me and worried. And of course at Penguin, like everywhere else, everybody's working at home. So, mm -hmm. you know, their whole process is the copy editor's there, the proofreader's there, the editor's there, but that they brought it all together and, you know, did a great job. And, you know, and I have to say, I think, the book is beautiful. I love the typeface of the book. It's very physically, I know you're reading on a Kindle, but if you look yeah. at the hardcover, it's very elegant and readable, just yeah. physically. Well, and and then, by, by the way, I say one other thing. So I don't know what they did. It's very lightweight. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes it's the paper that they choose. Yeah. They, 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 so it's, you know, if you read it in bed, it's not going to asphyxiate you. I mean, it's very <laughs> lightweight. So, um, it, you know, you, you bring up, you know, the, the notion of, on top of all of that, the, one of the things that's in the book, and again, to make people not afraid of the 492 pages, um, is that the, 
uh, you have a lot of pictures. Um, you, you, you choose your pictures, you choose your captions. Tell me a little bit about that process and why it was important or something. Well, I, I'd, I'd done it, you know, when I did my original, you know, my first big oil book was the second really, uh, the prize. Uh, I, we had a photo gallery and it was because of the photo gallery that it became a PBS, BBC series that like 20 million people saw. Mm -hmm. And so I've just learned it was really important to use the photos as another way to tell the story and not just boring photos of people standing there like that, but, you know, really interesting photos with things going on. And then to, those need to be integrated so that the captions, everyone has a, uh, has a punch to it that connects back to the book. And so you can almost follow the story by looking at the pictures and, you know, and get drawn into it and say, wow, you know, this is really interesting. So I see the pictures and the captions as a very integral part of the, of the book, not just a sort of addendum there to, uh, you know, to illustrate something, but they're part of the story. And, and so on that, what I'd like to do, um, and I'm going to remind the audience that we're, we're going to get to a Q&A section in a little bit. Um, and what I'd love is if folks would um, uh, use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, type in a question that you might have. And we, you and I, Dan, I'm going to bring up, um, hopefully I can do this right, um, a, uh, some of those pictures from the book. So rather than just asking you to summarize the book and all of its uh, different sections and stuff. I thought we could walk through a few of the pictures and you can kind of say what the picture is and, and how it relates to the book. Um, and I've, I put these pretty much in the order of the book, I think. Um, the first one, uh, these two pictures, uh, the, the gentleman on the, on the left and the yep. diagram, can you kind of explain the shale and what this yeah, all is? So the one on the right, just to explain it, is what a shale well is. It, it drills down 2,000 feet and then might go two miles horizontally. And that was the, break, the breakthrough to be able to take this very dense rock that all the textbooks said you can't produce oil and gas from it, figure out how to do it with what we heard, you know, that term fracking, hydraulic fracturing, and then that horizontal wells. So these are very high tech and you need really advanced computer digital capabilities to do it. So the guy on the left who's pointing there is a guy named George P. Mitchell. That is one stubborn guy he was the one who had this idea that you could get shale gas and then turned out oil out of the rocks. And he was, uh, people said, you're crazy. You're wasting your money. He said, well, it's my money. He owned the, the dominant position in his company. It took 18 years before they finally had six, well, 16 years till the breakthrough and then another few years. And um, I remember talking to his granddaughter and she said, you know, one call he has, he was really stubborn. <laughs> and if he hadn't been stubborn, you know, it, most companies would have said, this isn't going anywhere. Let's close it down. Waste of money. He got a lot of criticism even internally, but he said, you know, I know this has to work somehow. And it worked to the degree that the U S has gone from importing 60% of its oil. And, it, and you see the impact of that, you know, when you went to buy gasoline to uh, where we're now the world's largest oil producer. Pretty amazing. And, and you know, and his determination. He also, as you pointed out in the book, was very much an environmentalist. That he went yeah. into this wanting to, you know, stop coal and other things. Yeah, he, he created this uh, sort of uh, garden community uh, called the Woodlands outside Houston. And so he was uh, very much, you know, he saw natural gas as preferable to coal. Once out of the blue, I got a phone call from him, you know, I hadn't said anything, but somehow he said, I, he thought I'd said something about coal and he was, you know, natural gas is cleaner fuel. And what we've had in our, you know, the U.S. today, our CO2 emissions are down to the levels of the 19, 1990, although our economy has doubled. And it's largely because natural gas has replaced coal and electric generation. And, uh, so that's kind of where it all started. And, uh, and then you, you move through a lot of information about the U.S. and where we're at. And then you, you kind of jump into Russia. And uh, I just threw this picture in because I thought it was kind of funny. You yeah, this guy is uh, a guy who won a judo championship when he was about 25. <laughs> and in, in, this, in the Leningrad Evening News, they said, you're going to hear more from him. Well, we <laughs> have heard more from him. It's Vladimir Putin. And uh, I think of him in international affairs as a judoist. He has a, 
a weak hand. Russia's economy is only somewhat bigger than Spain's, but he takes advantage of other people's weaknesses to advance. And so I think what he does in, you know, people think of Russia as, as chess player. I think he's a, as the Russians called him, a judoist. And I think he applies judo in international affairs. And uh, he's, uh, he's uh, punching above, or he's punching or throwing, I guess in this case, <laughs> of his weight. And, uh, and this shot here with a uh, pipeline. Oh, those are the good old days when uh, it was okay to build a pipeline from Russia under the Baltic Sea to Germany. It was called Nord Stream 1, and there's Chancellor Merkel and then Russian President Medvedev, and they're turning the pipe to open it up. And this was considered a contribution to energy security to bring more clean natural gas. Today, it's a point of... There's Nord Stream 2, which is the current pipeline, $11 billion, three weeks from being finished. The U.S. put sanctions on it last December, and it's become a huge contention be between Russia uh, and the United States and very divisive in our relationship with Germany right now. And it's front and center in this whole issue of sanctions and Russian interference in the U.S. presidential elections and all those other factors. So those were happy days. You wouldn't see a photo like that today. No. Nope. And, uh, and this, about ah. uh, China and Putin. Yeah, so there's Putin with uh, Xi Jinping, who's the president of China, and uh, showing them, he, Putin is showing them how to make Russian pancakes, which are called blinis. And these guys have developed a really close relationship, so much so that on Xi's birthday, Putin brought him his favorite flavor of Russian ice cream. But at the same time that they were cooking up their pancakes, they were cooking up something much bigger, which, which Chinese troops for the first time were participating in a massive Russian military uh, war games. And the relationship between Russia and China has gotten much closer, based partly on energy, partly on tensions with the United States, uh, uh, partly on the nature of their regimes. Uh, and the two have, they describe each other as each other's best friends. And a real geopolitical reality is this new relationship between Russia and China which is something that you know matters a lot, uh, will matter a lot in the future to the United States, but um, they're gonna continue to cook together. Yeah, and, uh, and it, I find it funny that Jackie Chan makes it into the books, so if you wanna. Uh, I think, I wanna make a prediction here, Kerry, that this will be the only book on energy and geopolitics and climate that has Jackie Chan. Why is Jackie Chan in this book? is because China has this great $1.4 trillion project they call uh, the Belt and Road to make the middle kingdom, this, the middle of the world economy, to make China central through Central Asia, South Asia, into Europe, uh, into Africa, even uh, in a discussion that Xi, President Xi had with the president of Panama, even the Panama Canal. But it's not only a geopolitical and energy a strategic route thing. It also has an aesthetic side to it. So there's a Belt and Road Film Festival. And in that film festival, this movie was uh, uh, one of the, 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 the starring attractions, which is a movie called Kung Fu Yoga. And it's about a Chinese and uh, um, uh, Indian archaeologists who together discover, in their cooperation, a great new, uh, a great treasure. And ja Jackie Chan is the professor in it. And the line, it says there, uh, they said, it's so great, our cooperation. And the, the, the lady archaeologist uh, from India says, it would also be in line with the one belt, one road policy. And the, I think it's Jackie Chan says, so well said. So it's a, it's a way to demonstrate uh, that the Belt and Road uh, has many dimensions. And it's something uh, that's a very important feature of what's happening in global politics. Yeah. And then this is an interesting thing about China. Um, and do and you want to kind of explain this story? And no, you know, again, it strikes me so often that big breakthroughs sometimes come out of big organizations, sometimes come out of one guy. This guy's called Malcolm McLean. And he uh, grew up in a, t a town in North Carolina called Shoe Heel, Shoe Heel, North Carolina. And uh, he ran a trucking business and he was moving goods from uh, the East Coast, driving down to Texas. He said, there has to be a cheaper way to do it. What about driving the truck body right onto a ship and having a ship do it? And that became what is known as container shipping. So what you're seeing in the other picture 
is a container ship. And these are a huge, massive ship going into Shanghai's harbor. And this is what made China so central in the world economy, made China the workshop of the world because all these containers come to Long Beach, California, or Los Angeles, or New York, or Savannah, and so forth, and connect China to the world. This is, this, and it, this is kind of what really made the kind of modern globalization as we have now have it, when you, you know, have so much from China when you shop either online or in a store. Uh, and it's because of container shipping, because it made it economic to move cargoes. Because normally you used to have a lot of guys, uh, longshoremen who would, you know, lift and move, mm. pull and do things. Now, you know, just those containers get hoisted, hoisted from the back of a truck or a train, put on the ship, move 5,000 miles across the ocean. Another hoist takes them off and they get, end up in, um, at Walmart. Wow. And, uh, China is, is literally building islands. Yes. So there's a body of water called the South China Sea, which is um, south of China, uh, off Southeast Asia. And it is the most important highway for world commerce. One third of world commerce flows through it. Uh, China claims the South China Sea basically as its own. And it has a map that it calls a nine dash line map saying for historic reasons, this has always been China. The US doesn't accept that. All the countries, Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines around it don't accept it, but China has moved in and on a group of islands uh, has built up 3,200 acres, reclaimed 3,200 acres and turned them into basically floating uh, aircraft carriers. Those are runways that can take bombers on them. And uh, the US is challenging this. China. Uh, is worried, particularly one thing China really doesn't like is the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Navy's freedom of seas because it says if there's a controversy over Taiwan or something else happens, the U.S. could interrupt their flow of oil, among other things. And so they've built this up and we don't, the U.S. doesn't accept it. And although people don't realize that there've been several near collisions of U.S. and Chinese warships exactly because of the different views of the South China Sea. So to me, what I, one of the things I wanted readers to know is if you say, where might more serious problems come in world affairs, it could come in the South China Sea, which is not on most people's mindset right now, but keeping it, you know, watching, looking at what's happening there tells you that there's basically a military, military buildup uh, in that region. Yeah. And, and obviously, we tend to think of Saudi Arabia as, as this and the Arab world as the center point of oil, um, but it's not so much anymore. Um, and you well, talk right. Now, Saudi Arabia shares the, the dais with uh, the United States and, and, and with Russia. So on the left is Mohammed bin Salman, who's the crown prince who really runs the country, sitting under his picture of his grandfather, Ab Abdulaziz Ibn Saud, who created modern Saudi Arabia. It only became a real country in 1932. And uh, uh, Mohammed bin Salman will be the next ki king when his father uh, in that picture there um, uh, uh, passes away. And one of the things that's happened is that Russia has developed a kind of strategic relationship with Saudi Arabia. So this is when Putin was visiting in, um, in October, just a year ago actually, a state visit and as a gift they love falconry in the Arab world, brought him, of course, the world's largest falcon type of falcon, which is an Arctic falcon. Mm -hmm. And you can see King Salman was very happy to receive this as his, uh, as his present. I forgot the name of the falcon, but it, uh, okay. you know, it uh, kind of signifies uh, their relationship. So it was a Siberian, uh, Siberian falcon in Saudi Arabia. And uh, in, the, in, in the book, you kind of move out of this geopolitical conversation and start talking about technology. This, this picture kind of illustrates that notion of how technology also drives these issues. Um, kind of want to explain. You know, yes, so Carrie, we are in a, um, an energy transition. Uh, the energy mix is changing. A lot of debate about the change of it. And I try and have a framework for thinking about energy transition. You know, the term is clean energy, wind and solar. And I wanted to convey that energy transitions have been going on for a long time. 
And it was in the 14th, it sort of began in the 13th and 14th century when the price of wood went through the roof in England and people started using coal for heating. But I date the beginning of the energy transition that we're still living through to January of 1709. This is a village called Colebrook, Colebrook Dale in Shropshire in England. And there was an iron worker there named Abraham Darby and he figured out how to use coal to make iron in an improved process over burning wood. And so I say, you know, Colebrookdale is really when the energy transition began. And here we are in the year 2020 and we're still in energy transition. We went from coal to oil, natural gas, nuclear. And the interesting thing is how long it was that, you know, 19th century Britain ruled the waves, their ship, coal, steam and everything. It wasn't until, two, uh, until, uh, 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 until the beginning of the 20th century that coal actually became half a world energy supply. Oil was discovered in the US in 1859. It wasn't until the 1960s that coal took over from, uh, from oil took over from coal. So, you know, so that's part of the discussion today about how fast energy transitions can happen and, you know, and uh, say in a sense being realistic about it. And um, some of the technologies, these are four different people on the same topic. Uh, right. Well, the two people on the left, mm -hmm. is that, yeah, I think the left, the two people with the, the top one is Thomas Edison with his electric car. And he put a lot of money and effort into getting an electric car, never gained traction. And then down below is a reincarnation of Thomas Edison, Elon Musk, who, um, you know, that's one of those stories, you know, if he hadn't gone to a fish restaurant in the early 2000s uh, and met some guys uh, who wanted to talk about an electric airplane and then electric car, maybe we'd never have the Tesla and would never would still, you know, electric car would still be back with Thomas Edison. But so that, you know, I just like the photograph because you saw it was like a century apart, but you saw one great innovator and then another. On the other side is Mary Barra who is the uh, CEO and chairman of General Motors. And uh, I, I had a conversation and I interviewed Mary for the book. And she says that her goal for General Motors is zero collisions, zero congestion, and zero em uh, emissions. So G GM, like others, is moving towards an electric car. Uh, combine it, well, we'll get to ride hailing. And the guy, uh, be, be, uh, Below him is uh, Mr. Wang, who was the father of the electric car in China. He was Minister of Technology, uh, and he's really pushed it. And China is where you have half the world's electric cars now. So I think he and uh, Elon Musk are really the two, if we said the fathers of the modern electric vehicle, it's those two guys. Okay. And obviously that's going to have a huge impact on the energy industry and everything about yes, it. Yes, and the automobile industry. And then these two guys at the Eiffel Tower. Well, those are two guys uh, at the Eiffel Tower uh, who uh, happened to be there and uh, had this idea uh, that uh, you could, um, you didn't have to hail a taxi. You could do it on your iPhone. And uh, they went up uh, there and talked about how to do it. Do you need to own the cars or do you just need to have the software to do it? And everybody, you know, would be self-employed. And they're the two founders of uh, Uber. And uh, they got stuck in a snowstorm, and nowhere to go. They went up to the top of the Eiffel Tower and, you know, kind of hammered out the idea for Uber. <laughs> so I love the picture. And, uh, and then, you know, you've talked about, renewable and solar and wind and these are just yeah in china well well we've had a shale revolution i talked about we've had a solar revolution the cost of solar panels like down 85 percent and a lot of that is because of chinese manufacturing scale and juggernaut and power and this is in china where they're putting the panels on the roof and china provides 70 percent of the world's solar panels and chinese companies elsewhere another 10 percent so China is very well positioned in solar energy. And the, that fall in costs has taken something that was not competitive uh, and made it very competitive now. And uh, in the last picture, um, you mentioned it's the last chapter of the book. This is kind of a scary picture. Those are all full yeah. tankers. 
Yeah, those oil tankers that when, uh, when the economic dark age descended and businesses weren't running and people were staying home and no one was on the road and commuting, you had this flood of oil that was coming in. And those were all tankers off the coast of Los Angeles that simply couldn't unload the oil because there was no place to put the oil. And it was that that then led to this uh, thing where the U.S. really brokered uh, a deal to stabilize the oil market, which would have been kind of unthinkable. And, uh, you know, prices are still low, but, but now there are places to put the oil. But, uh, you know, a lot of people still are not, most people are still not commuting. Yeah. And, and so I think we've, we've, we've kind of given a, a fun overview of the book with some pictures. So I thought we'd turn it over to our, our guests and see what kind of questions they have. Um, I, I see a first question up here from Carolyn Curiel. Um, and I think we're going to see if we can get her live to ask you her question. Give us just one minute. And if you haven't asked a question yet, please hit the Q&A button. If you've got a question for Dan on the topic of the book or on his writing, um, and we will um, we'll get to your question uh, as quick as we can. So first up is Carolyn. Carolyn, you're there. I am, although I can't see either of you for some reason, uh -oh. but, uh, but I am here. Um, so first of all, um, Mr. Jurgen, it's a real honor and pleasure to have you as a guest at the museum. And uh, I just want to thank you. Uh, I'm one of the trustees of the museum and just so enjoy uh, your work and uh, what you've been talking about today. I have not yet read this book, I will confess, but I am interested, especially in the issue of fracking. And the, the of issue of what? Mentioned. Fracking. Oh, right. Fracking. And as you mentioned, the uh, topic did come in last night in the uh, presidential debate. It's a really little understood issue uh, across the United States um, which is a bit shocking considering its impact on communities. But I wonder if you would please speak more about the road ahead. Uh, I know you've been very thoughtful on this issue uh, and the implications of uh, what it means to, uh, to revisit this issue uh, and uh, in terms of uh, our independence of oil and uh, the geopolitics that are involved between China and Russia as all part of this picture. And I'm gonna stop talking and let you talk, thank you. Well, thank you for your question and comment. So let me take two parts of that. One is the geopolitical significance. And the, uh, I don't use the word I in the book, uh, maybe once or twice, but mostly, uh, but there's a scene in the book where a person, it was me, asked Vladimir Putin uh, a question of, and he was on a platform with Chancellor Merkel uh, so I asked the first question, I was asking, when are you going to diversify your economy so you're not so dependent on oil? This was a few years ago when things were a little different. But I backed and said shale, and he started shouting at me. And I realized that he didn't like uh, shale for two reasons. One is because the U.S. was competing with Russia uh, now uh, in Europe to be an energy supplier. And two, because he saw it really enhanced the position of the United States and our influence in the world. I've seen Prime Minister Modi in, England, in India has talked about how important the energy element that we export energy to India is in the overall relationship. Uh, the other side of it, as you say, it's, uh, it's controversial. Um, I was on the commission that um, uh, President Obama appointed to look at the environmental issues around shale and concluded that it is it's an industrial activity. It has to be regulated uh, properly and it generally is regulated properly. And if so, it's very beneficial in terms of job creation, uh, in terms of supporting industry, manufacturing industry, business investment, so forth. And of course, on foreign policy. Uh, and if we didn't have it, you know, when I do hear people say ban fracking, to me, that's really just an import more oil policy. It means money would go, instead of circulating the U.S., would go into other countries' treasuries. So that's kind of the way I think about it. Uh, and I say that it has to be properly regulated uh, as, an, as an activity. But it is, it is, it's a bigger revolution with more impact, I think, as your question suggested, than people may generally recognize. And uh, so I think we have, a question along that same topic, but we'll see um, 
All right, Geraldine, I'm going to ask your question that I see here. Um, but it's, uh, I think what you were trying to ask was if water is more valuable than oil, um, but fracking uses quantities of it and, and potentially poisons that water for future use, um, why should we befoul water for fossil fuel? Well, I think that's early on, there was a lot of concern about water. I think experience has shown that actually there's not a problem there. This occurs at a whole different depth below drinking water. And you know there are a few examples where people debate whether there's a specific spill or so forth, but I don't think there is a trade-off between uh, water and, uh, and oil here and natural gas. Uh, and in fact, there's also a lot of innovation that's gone on this is, this is a constantly innovating process to use uh, less water, to re, re, reuse water and so forth. So I think, um, you know, obviously, obviously water is a very important issue, but I think that was one of the things we looked at when we did that commission for uh, President Obama. And um, I think that um, things that people see like uh, that you light a match and, the, and water burns in at least one case in the famous movie, it wasn't even from a, a shale well. So uh, I don't, you know, as I say, again, it has to be regulated and managed properly, but largely it is. And if we would not have the scale of this industry that we have now, if there were major environmental problems, because we'd read about them every day and we don't. Yeah. And um, the, uh, uh as you talk about that, there's something else you bring up in the book, and I didn't include this picture, but I just make, want to ask a follow-up question on that, which is the notion of people without um, access to energy um, yeah. and, and, and the health and, and environmental issues for those people that we don't necessarily think about for those of us who live with electricity by turning on the switch. Right. Well, I mean, you know, in terms of energy, those of us who live in North America those of us who live in Europe are, you know, are very privileged. We're a small part of the population. Uh, the World Health Organization talks about the forgotten 3 billion. It's about 40% of the world population. And they're the people who cook with waste wood, uh, animal waste, crop waste. And the World Health Organization, which of course is now famous because of COVID, uh, says that that's the biggest single environmental problem in the world is indoor air pollution. So I've been, quite active involved with India on this. And India is saying on the one hand, we wanna to move to wind and solar. On the other hand, we really wanna to move to natural gas uh, and, and propane because we wanna free people from the tyranny of, of indoor air pollution. And so we want wind and solar. We also want traditional commercial energy. So in India, the notion of an energy transition is a very different concept than the issue that those of us who are you know, lucky to live in this part of the world and don't have the same kind of abject po poverty that uh, they do. India is an example. I had a conversation with the, the Nigerian energy minister who said the same thing. He said, what works in the Netherlands and Germany doesn't work for us. We're a poor country with 200 million people. We have to get commercial energy to them. So yeah. I think that is something to keep in mind when you look at the numbers. And uh, so we're going to uh, take another question here from John Esty. I don't know if you know John, he's on our board. Um, but uh, John is coming online now. Oh, great. Uh, th thanks a lot for doing this. This has really been very, very interesting. I confess to not having read your book, but I'm now motivated to do so. Great. Um, Thank you. You, you mentioned uh, today that uh, China has developed a strong, a very strong solar power capabilities and has, has the dominant share. How do you see this one developing? Will other countries soon catch up as, this, as the technologies become a bit more commoditized? And if they don't, uh, will we have some geopolitical issues with China sort of controlling the supply? Well, I think that um, in a sense, the business has, that's a very good way to put it, has been commoditized already by China because of their ability to manufacture at scale more cheaply. One of the things I don't quite understand and I can't, you know, it's quite controversial, how much of this is China's manufacturing skill? How much is it its subsidies of one kind or another that do it? So I think it's difficult for other countries to catch up at the price point that China can do it. So, you know, China is the cheapest 
source of it. Um, other countries could, do, I mean, India is struggling with it right now. You know, there was a, a shooting episode between China and India in the Himalayas. And one of the things the Chinese, the Indians want to do is import less solar panels from China. The question is, can they do it as cheaply or not? So there's that. China also dominates the lithium ion battery uh, supply chain, which, uh, and then thirdly, uh, rare earths. So they've moved to be there. I, you see a kind of awakening now in the U.S. and uh, and in um, and in Europe about you know just beginning to be concerned about that. And the study that I'm now working on is called New Supply Chains for a Net Zero Carbon Economy, which is saying you know if you look at the scale of what the ambitions are, and we, we see it in the Joe Biden's two trillion dollar climate plan, you're going to be building a lot of things. And that means importing a lot of stuff from China. And you're going to need a lot of big shovels because there's going to be a lot of mining. And so I think you're kind of pointing to what is going to become a much more prominent issue in the next couple of years, which is those supply chains and where's the security problem and where there's not a security problem. And, uh, and then um, and that's, that's a really interesting piece. Um, I think we're going to ask a question from Linda Mensch. Uh, so, Linda, you want to go ahead and ask your question? Um, well, we hear a lot about the mini earthquakes that they're finding in North Dakota. And I am wondering how the industry is protecting the uh, underbelly of the earth from um, earthquakes right. and other issues caused by fracking. Well, that is, you know, that's one of those issues about regulation. I'm not familiar with North Dakota. I do know about the earthquakes in Oklahoma. Uh, and they were centered, I think, in the kind of more of the eastern part of the state. And there it had to do, it goes back to that water question, uh, wastewater, instead of being reprocessed, was being injected into geological faults uh, where it should not have been injected. And that was a regulatory failure. And that's why you got these, these swarms of uh, earthquakes. And so th that's an exact example of why, you know, proper regulation is needed. I didn't know about North Dakota, but I will look into that. So thank you. And uh, I think we have another question. But, but by the way, I just say one thing that's interesting about North Dakota to me is, you know, country with the largest oil reserves in the world right now is Venezuela. And right now, North Dakota produces more oil than Venezuela. I mean, it's a kind of amazing turnaround. Wow. And, uh... We have a, a question. The one possible reason why the U.S. seems to be slow to build a consensus and act on climate change is the influence of lobbyists and senators representing fossil fuel states. Do you think the fossil fuel industry and its influence on politicians is a big reason why the U.S. is not leading the world transition from fossil um, to renewable sources? Um, I think you're seeing, uh, you know, an evolution in the companies. Uh, you know, some of the companies now are saying that they're going to no longer be these the European majors are no longer going to be oil and gas companies are going to be energy companies. Um, I think it gets down to specific, you know, regulatory processes. But I think that, you know, I don't think they're, they're not in a position to stop state regulators or a, a Biden administration from, you know, increasing the incentives and subsidies for wind and solar or the mandatory requirements. And that's going to happen, you know, uh, if Joe Biden is president. And I could see already, I spoke um, a little while ago to, the, you know, senior leadership of the U.S. electric power industry. And, you know, what they're, the general message that they're saying is more wind, more solar. They're, you know, whether, whether Trump is president or Biden's president, that's the direction uh, that they're moving in. But wind and solar, one thing to keep in mind, don't really replace oil. I mean, yeah. unless no. everybody has an electric car. <laughs> um, and so I think uh, Ernie uh, is uh, someone who has a question and it kind of ties on that about the companies. Uh, Bernie, you want to go ahead and ask your question? Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, very interesting conversation here. I, so, yeah, I guess, the, you know, my question kind of, follows uh, the, the previous question and also uh, what John had asked about um, the, the countries. And so my, my question is, you know, is which, which companies, I guess, you know, international, multinational companies are, seem to be transitioning best away from oil and some of the other traditional resources and towards uh, these renewable 
resources, especially um, solar. Uh, for, for instance, you know, these multinational companies like Exxon or Shell, BP, uh, which one, are there some companies that kind of really stand out that are, are doing uh, more in the way of renewable resources? Yeah, you see the difference. Um, it's interesting because two historical factoids that are in the book, one of the two founders of the solar industry in the United States was Exxon. And the lithium ion battery in electric cars was invented in an Exxon laboratory in 1976 when uh, it was thought the world was going to run out of oil. Uh, that said, uh, the European majors, the BPs, the Shells, the Totals, the Equinor, those are the companies that are sort of re, re calling themselves uh, uh, energy companies. I think, I think, I mean, they're investing in electric charging, uh, uh, you know, players in wind, uh, renewables, uh, so, you know, Total owns one of the only uh, American solar energy companies that's left. So those are the companies that are transitioning more uh, in, that, in that direction. And, you know, you know, Europe is different than the United States in its politics and, its, and, and in terms of public opinion. So I think that's where you see it uh, more strongly. It is interesting that you see these companies that are emerging that are very strong, let's say, in wind, like uh, Next Era Energy. And um, in my previous book, The Quest, I had a story about they sort of fell into it by accident. And now they're, you know, a very highly valued company. Uh, and I think as you have investors you know, more interested in renewables, uh, they're going gravi to gravitate to those companies that are more active in that. Uh, well, that, that's a, a very interesting uh, set of questions. And, and we kind of hit that hour mark where we like to try and wrap these things up. And so, um, Dan, I just want to thank you for a very informative conversation, for, for talking with some of our audience, for, um, for you know, just putting all of this together. And um, it's a great book, and I'm glad we had a chance to talk about it. Well, thank you, Carrie. I'm very glad to I had the chance at the American Writers Museum to talk about writing, uh, yeah. which I often don't get a chance to do, because it's uh, an activity that you mainly do by yourself. You know, you know, <laughs> it's not a group activity. Uh, secondly, to talk about, you know, uh, the issues that we've done. And I think the questions really show the focus that people have on energy transition, how it's developing, and so, you know, those questions were very much, you know, one to really key questions and to, um, you know, talk about these issues, which I find very interesting, but also, um, as I think you found when you read the book, uh, it's, a, you know, it's a great story too. A lot of really interesting people in it and, uh, you know, a lot of surprises. So glad to have the chance to talk about the new map. Thank you and thank the museum. Oh, thank you, Dan. Thank everybody who joined us today. Um, and we will post in the chat one more time the link to buy the book directly from our partner at Seminary Co-op. Um, so if you didn't get a chance, go into the chat's function and you'll see the link uh, to buy the book. And everyone should get a good read of it. And I recommend uh, the hardcover as the Kindle does not put the pictures until the end of the book. If you do download it, scan to the back so you can see the pictures. There are a lot of right. them. So thank you, Dan. And thank, thank you, you very much, Carrie. Bye-bye now. Bye.